Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is Station. I'm ready for the event. Microsoft Education, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. This is Microsoft Education. Do you hear me? I hear you loud and clear. How do you hear me? <laughs> we hear you. Wow, Jessica, it is an incredible honor to speak with you. Um, and we have uh, students from over three, from three Washington schools. We have the NASA STEM um, program, and then a few of us from Microsoft and Xbox. What an honor, and we are so excited uh, to be able to talk to you. And I'm gonna hand it over to the kids and to Karen to ask you all the questions we have. Thank you for being with us today. You're very welcome. It's wonderful to speak to you all in Seattle. I lived in Vancouver, BC for three years, so I love the Pacific Northwest. Let's bring on the questions. Well, we have our first student here. Hi, my name is Henry. I'm from Washington. I'm asking a question on behalf of, on behalf of student Gregory, Gregory from Ohio. Their question is, what is the most beautiful, interesting, or unusual thing you've experienced, heard, or seen throughout your time in space? That is a difficult question because there are so many incredible things that we experience and that we see every day. One of my favorite things to do though is in a little bit of free time that we have when we're not busy working on experiments or repairing things on the space station, I try to get to the window and look out at the cupola and look back on Earth. Actually, I was just there a few minutes before this, and it was one of my favorite passes. It was nighttime, and we were coming up over Asia, and you could see all of the bright squid lights from the fishing boats, the squid fishing boats that are shining these big lanterns down toward the ocean, and the squid come up, and you see all those green and orange lights in the water, and you can see all the city lights, and we passed further north. You could see distinctly the light, the border between North Korea and South Korea, given that there's so many more lights in South Korea than North Korea. So many amazing things to see out of the window here. I saw an annular eclipse while I was on the space station, so I could actually see this gray spot on the uh, on the planet below. So instead of looking all blue, there was one area that was all gray, and it was the shadow of the moon that was casting down on the Earth. So many amazing phenomena to see every day from up here. We are very fortunate to have this beautiful vantage point. from Washington State. I'm asking a question on behalf of Aram from Turkey. Their question is, by performing the first ever all-woman spacewalk, you've inspired me. Thank you. Why do you think there are fewer female astronauts than male astronauts? How many have you met? Well, thank you so much for that. It really meant so much to both Christina and I to see what an effect it really had on the planet. And for us, we were just out there doing our job that day. But once we saw how much people really reacted to it and how much it inspired and made people excited about the space program, excited for their to pursue their own dreams, it really meant so much to us. Right now, well, it is true that there were there have been fewer female astronauts than male astronauts, and that has really been true historically through a lot of the STEM technical fields, so science, technology, engineering, math. We have had an underrepresentation of women in the past, and there are many reasons for that. But the good thing is, the very positive thing, is that that is changing in the right direction now. Right now in the astronaut office, we have about 33% of the office is female, so not quite half yet, but we're trending in that direction. And and in my class, we were selected in 2013, and there were eight of us. And we actually did have 50% women and 50% men. So as you can see, we're moving in the right direction. By the time you guys are applying to be astronauts, who knows, maybe it'll be even more than half. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jada from Washington State. I'm asking a question on behalf of student Gallia from the United Arab Emirates. Their question is, what do you think of the future programs that call for flights to the moon and Mars? Should we focus on returning to the moon and building a new station to carry out important experiments, or is it better for us to go to Mars? 
Well, our plan at NASA right now is to go to the moon. We'll be sending the first woman and the next man to the moon, hopefully in the next several years. And that is through the Artemis program. And I think it is a very important first step to first return to the moon before we go further to Mars. Really, we will be using that destination as a proving ground to help demonstrate how we will get to Mars. And we'll, then we will use that as a launching point in order to make that next step. So the moon is really far away from us. You know, right now here on the International Space Station, I'm only about 250 miles away from the Earth. The moon is 250,000 miles away. And Mars, depending on what time of year it is, is millions of miles away. So we really need to use this incremental way, this incremental process of demonstrating technology, demonstrating all the things that we need to do to accomplish a successful mission. So I think what we are doing right now at NASA is the right thing to do. We're still maintaining this research on the internet National Space Station. What we're learning here is helping us get back to the moon. Then what we'll be learning on the moon, we will be using to take that next step in going to Mars. So I think there's a place for all of it along the road. And if we take one step at a time, that will really guarantee our success in the end. Thank you. Hi, my name is Itasha from Washington State. I'm asking a question on behalf of student Ezra from the United Arab Emirates. Their question is, why do astronauts use their legs and feet to carry or grip something instead of using their hands to hold while working on the space station? Do you feel pressure on your feet and where do you feel the most pressure? Well, if you think about it up here, since we don't have gravity, when you're on the ground, your feet, you don't need to do anything to keep your feet in place, right? Gravity is just pulling your feet toward the ground and your hands are free to do whatever you want. Up here, we float. So if we don't secure our feet somehow, then we won't stay in place. So what we do is we actually can use a handrail in any location and we can slide our feet underneath of that handrail. Or I can show you right here. If I could put my feet underneath this, underneath this here, then that will actually free up my hands. So now I can work with my hands. So that's really important for us to maintain some stability so that, that we can then accomplish our work effectively. So what happens is we have these handrails and different things that will hook our feet underneath. And you actually get the most pressure, I would say about here at this joint between your toes and your metatarsals. And then sometimes here on top of the surface of the foot at the metatarsals. And so your feet aren't really used to that. When you first get up here, it takes some time to adapt to that and your feet are actually, can be a little bit sore on the top as you're using them to hold yourself down. But then, you know, you kind of build up the tolerance to that and it becomes easier and easier. But, you know, sometimes we have some marks on our feet by the time we get back to earth because we've built up some small calluses on the tops of our feet instead of the bottoms like we would on the earth. Thank you. Hi, my name is Juliana from Washington State. My question is, what does it feel like to have your blood constantly rush into your head for months at a time? How uncomfortable is it to you and is it a constant feeling? So again, similar to what we were talking about for the last question, you know, there is no upside down in space. So if I go like this, it all feels the same as the position that I was just in, even though it looks upside down to you. But you're right, without gravity, our blood and our body fluids do kind of lift up in our bodies. And that's because on Earth, the gravity is always pulling that blood down toward your feet. So suddenly when you remove that pressure, things have this upward shift and you can really feel it in your head. And I'll tell you, it feels just like if you're hanging upside down on the monkey bars. As soon as, when you're in the rocket and as soon as you get into space, you feel like you're hanging upside down. And I felt like I was a bat, especially for those first few weeks. You felt like you were just spending all your time hanging upside down so your, your head felt kind of full sometimes you felt a little bit congested but your body actually is quite remarkable that it can adapt quite quickly to this new physiological set point and things kind of reach a new homeostasis or a new general internal stability and then you don't really notice that so much so it really just lasts for those first few weeks where it feels a little bit odd um, but I would compare it to the monkey bars or if you know how a bat feels when they're hanging upside down Thank you. Hi, my name is Abigail from Washington State. I'm asking questions on behalf of students Asdanasia from Malaysia and Alvis from Italy. Their questions are, what research do you do aboard the International Space Station? 
What should I study if I want to be an astronaut and do the kind of research you do? Well, the nice thing is we have a huge variety of different types of experiments up here. I'm actually a scientist, so I love all the different experiments that we participate in, and they range from physiology and medicine to biotechnology to combustion science, planetary physics, all different types of sciences are represented. But the common theme is a STEM field, so science, technology, engineering, math. If you are interested in any of those fields, I really, I really encourage you to pursue those. That is the best path if you do want to become an astronaut. You do have to have a degree in one of those STEM fields and also a master's degree in the STEM field as well. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bamla from Washington State and my question is, when did you know you wanted to be an astronaut? Did you think it was possible when you were growing up? I started saying I wanted to be an astronaut when I was five years old and I essentially didn't stop saying it my entire life. And I don't know if I really thought it would come true. I think we, you know, we all know that there's such a small chance of becoming an astronaut. It doesn't matter how great you are, there's just really a, a lot of luck involved as well. You know, for me, when I applied and, and I was interviewing, I met so many incredible people who also dreamed of being an astronaut and had worked so hard in their lives as well. And in the end, you know, it is a numbers game. It's a difficult thing to achieve, but the nice thing is, I am proof that there is a chance that dreams really can come true. I didn't think it would necessarily happen for me. I applied a, a few times before and it didn't happen and then in the end it did. So you you really need to remember that you need to, to keep at it, to work hard and to not give up even if you fail along the way. Thank you. Hi, my name is Catherine from Washington State. I'm asking a question on behalf of student Gregory from Ohio. Their question is, as an astronaut, you are someone who everyone can look up to. Who do you look up to? Well, thank you very much. That means a lot. I've had a lot of amazing role models throughout my life. First of all, my siblings. I was the youngest, I am the youngest of five kids, so I had three older sisters and an older brother to look up to. My parents were so encouraging of all of us, and they were wonderful role models for me. I had some amazing science teachers that really did a lot and changed a lot for me, as well as my mentors in graduate school and, and after graduate school as well. But I really look up to anybody that has a passion, even if it has nothing to do with space. It doesn't have to be like my passion. But if they have a passion and they work hard to try to do something better for the world, to try to improve things. Another example, Greta Thunberg, the Swedish climate activist. She's only 17 years old and she's already doing a huge amount to try to change things and improve conditions on our home planet. So to me, I think those are the most important factors. People that have passion and people that are willing to work hard and make those things come to fruition. Thank you. Hi, my name is Luke from Washington State. I'm asking a question on behalf of the student Stacy from the United Kingdom. Their question is, how has the view from space changed in the last decade? And from space, can you see the climate change on Earth? Yeah, well, going along with climate change like we were just talking about, you can actually see those effects from the space station. One of the best examples is monitoring the retreat of glaciers all around the world. And this is something I did just a couple days ago. We take photos from the International Space Station to show how the those glaciers are shrinking, how they're retreating over time. We have several years and years worth of pictures of the same glaciers taken in the same spot. So we can use that data to help scientists understand what is happening with these glaciers. Thank you. Hi, my name is John from Washington State. I'm asking a question on behalf of the student, Rhoda, from the United Arab Emirates. Their question is, without an oxygen source in space, can a model farm be established to produce oxygen? That would be a great and very sustainable way of producing oxygen, so that would be a great idea. It would take a lot of plants, though. So, for example, for the space station, that's not really feasible because it would take hundreds of plants to make enough oxygen for one crew member. So what we do on the International Space Station is we use a process called electrolysis in an oxygen gen generative system. And basically what happens is we use electricity to split water molecules into hydrogen and oxygen, and that way we can provide oxygen for the crew. We also have some tanks of oxygen that are flown up for the ground when we have to replenish those as well. 
Thank you. Hi, my name is Abdullah from Washington State. I am asking a question on behalf of the student Khadia from the United Arab Emirates. Their question is, is it possible for human beings to live on Mars? Um, what factors made NASA choose Mars for research and experiments? Well, there are a lot of things that we would need in order to live on Mars, and that would be the things that we need to sustain a presence anywhere in space, like we are here up in the International Space Station. We would need some type of, type of pressurized habitat with an atmosphere that we could breathe, because humans cannot breathe the atmosphere on Mars. So we would need, a, like the last question mentioned, something that produced oxygen that we could breathe, and we would need protection from radiation. We would need a pressurized structure for us to live in if we were going to not be in spacesuits the whole time. So. All the same kind of things that we use need in other space environments. Mars has captivated the imaginations of humans for hundreds and hundreds of years now. And I think one of the reasons is because it is one of our closest planets and it is quite similar to Earth. It's it's not all that far off in terms of size. There's very a lot of evidence now that there was water on Mars and that the atmosphere was once more dense and thicker. And so there's a very good chance that there could have been life on Mars. So that's one of the one of the good reasons for why it makes a lot of sense for us to try to learn more and explore Mars further. In doing so, we'll learn a lot more about Earth and the rest of our solar system as well. Thank you. Hi, my name is Emmanuel from Washington State. I am asking a question on behalf of student Mustafa from Palestine. Their question is, does time pass the same way as it does on Earth? How does your body adapt to the change in day and night when you return to Earth from space? That's a pretty complicated question, actually. There is something called time dilation, and that has to do with the pull of a large object, the gravitational pull of a large object like Earth. And so th it, we actually do know scientifically that toward the center of that mass, so toward the center of the Earth, time actually passes more slowly because of that gravitational pull. So since I'm further away from the center of the Earth, time is actually passing more quickly for me. But it becomes even more complicated than that since there's also dilation caused by the relative velocity. And because I'm up here in orbit traveling 17,500 miles per hour, going around the Earth very, very, very quickly, that actually slows down time a little bit for me. And that effect is actually larger than the gravitational effect. Now, it really isn't something that we would ever even notice. So really, the simple answer is time passes the same. We have 24 hours of the day up here, and we have normal kind of sleep and wake cycles. But it comes out to be, I I think in my approximately seven month mission, it'll be about 0. 0.0005 seconds less. That that's how much time less would have passed for me up here. So it's really nothing that's very significant. Once we get back down on Earth, our bodies can adapt to the day night cycles using several of the receptors and the parts of our brain that are responsible for utilizing those circadian rhythms once again. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jamie from Washington State. I am asking a question on behalf of the student Landon from Ohio. Their question was, what was going through your mind when you took off on a rocket for the first time? Very many things were going through my mind. I couldn't believe that it was actually happening. But it's interesting. One of the things that really is quite representative in everything that we do as astronauts is that we have so much incredible training on the ground, hours and hours and hours of training for everything that we do. And that was very true for the Soyuz spacecraft that I launched in as well. And I, we were in such high quality simulators and training with the Russian space program that when I was in that spacecraft, it looked exactly the same like all of the simulators and trainers did on the ground. So I was going through all of exactly the same motions that I had been trained to do. And I actually had to remind myself that this was a real rocket. And every once in a while, you would feel it move or a little bit, or you would hear it groan with the engines. And that would remind you that this really was the real thing. But because we had trained so much for everything that we do, it feels already quite familiar. And sometimes you have to remind yourself that it's actually happening. Well, thank you very much on the behalf of all the students around the world that ask questions and the students here in the audience. And I'd now like to pass it off to astronaut Dottie. 
Jessica, this is Dottie metcalf Lindenberger, and thank you so much for sharing your passion. It's a pleasure to see you on orbit, and we're just thankful that all these students had a chance to ask you questions and students around the world. And thanks back to our mission control as well. You all are inspiring. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank, thank you so much, Dottie. It's great to hear from you. I'm, I'm glad that you're there with the students today. Thank you, everybody. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes our event as we count down to 20 continuous years of humans living and working on the International Space Station. Thank you to all participating from Microsoft Education Station. We are now resuming operational audio communications.